Hi guys, this is Andrew Burgess for NetTuts, and today we are starting a new screencast series here on NetTuts all about Ruby. We're going to learn about Ruby, we're going to learn about Rails, we're going to learn about a bunch of other technologies that Ruby developers use, and hopefully you'll join us for the ride. So let's get started right away with uh, by answering the question, why Ruby? So there are a number of reasons that I find compelling as to why you'd want to use Ruby as your server-side language as opposed to PHP or one of the uh, many other server-side languages. The first is that Ruby is a very flexible language. That means that there's often very many ways to do a certain task. Even something like looping over array, an array of objects, can be done several different ways, and so it's up to you as the developer to decide which way is most expressive or which way is best for um, whatever project you're currently working on. Um, another reason that I enjoy Ruby is that it's really easy to learn. You'll find that as we get started, you'll be writing programs without too much trouble at all, and the further we go, the more you'll learn, and you'll find it's it's really just not that hard to pick up. <clears throat> also, Ruby has a lot of great frameworks for working with. Obviously, one of the biggest would be Ruby on Rails, and hopefully we'll get to picking up some of that stuff a bit later on in this series. But even something like um, one of my favorites is Sinatra, and we'll learn a lot about that as well. And there are many other frameworks, not necessarily specifically for the web, although we're going to focus on some of those in this series. So that's another good reason to use Ruby. Finally, I like Ruby because it appears simple on the surface, but there's a lot of complexity being masked underneath. So where in something like PHP, I might have to write a whole function to do something myself, in Ruby that's built in and it takes one line to call it. So it's that kind of thing um, that attracted me to Ruby in the beginning, and I hope you'll find the same thing as we uh, go through these screencasts. So let's start right now by installing Ruby on your computer. We're going to start with Windows and then we'll look at Mac in a moment. So let's go ahead and install Ruby on a Windows computer. Alright, so here we are on Windows Vista. I'm going to start by opening a browser and we're going to go to ruby-lang.org. That is the official Ruby website. And right over here on the right you'll see the download Ruby button. So I'll just click on that. And then right down here, Ruby on Windows. The easiest way to install Ruby is using the Ruby installer. And you can see we've got a bunch of different options for versions right now. Um, we're going to choose Ruby 1.9.2, the very latest version of Ruby. And that's installed or downloaded, so there we go. Let's run this. Accept the license agreement. Um, I'm going to add Ruby ex executables to my path and associate the Ruby files with this installation of Ruby. And then I'll go ahead and install it. One thing to note as this is installing, that we're installing Ruby 1.9, or a version of Ruby 1.9, and this is much different than Ruby 1.8. Um, a lot of things changed in Ruby between version 1.9, I'm sorry, 1.8 and 1.9, and um, most of what we'll be learning in today's, or in this screencast series, is going to be based on Ruby 1.9. So, um... That's a little, a little caveat there, just in case you're running Ruby 1.8. And that is installed already. So now to ch check to make sure it got installed, we can open up a terminal, and we can run Ruby uh, dash version. Actually, no, dash dash version. Two dashes there. And there you can see Ruby 1.9.2, released just about um, two months ago, almost. All right. So there we go. So that is installing Ruby on Windows. In review, just go to the Ruby website, download the Ruby 1.9.2 installer, and install it. All right, now let's talk about installing Ruby on the Mac. Um, we're not actually going to walk through an installation of Ruby on the Mac for several reasons. First of all, Ruby is pre-installed on the Mac. Um, this is actually Ruby 1.8, so if you choose to use the pre-installed version, that's fine, and most of what we'll talk about, especially for the first several weeks, will be very, very similar to um, what, we'll, what we'll be doing in Ruby 1.9, and you'll probably notice no difference at all. However, if you want to go to Ruby 1.9, then um, you can install it via something like Mac Ports or Fink, or maybe even Homebrew, I'm not sure about that. 
if you use any of these package managers, you should be able to install Ruby through that. If you're feeling a little more adventurous, and this is what I've actually done, you can install Ruby from the source code. So you'll go to that Ruby website, and I'll have a link to Dan Benjamin's excellent instructions on how to install Ruby, Ruby from source. The one thing I'll note here is that in his instructions, when you're installing Ruby from source, he also has you install the Ruby Gems library. Ruby Gems are just um, an easy way to package up functionality, like little libraries, and the Ruby Gems um, program makes it really easy to install and update these little um, programs that other people can share. And of course, you can make your own gems and share them with others as well. However, in Ruby 1.9, this Ruby Gems functionality has been um, built right into Ruby, and so you don't have to install Ruby Gems separately if you're installing Ruby 1.9. So if you have any questions about installing Ruby on your Mac, um, feel free to email me via my, the forum on my, uh, on my website, andrewvergis.ca, and um, I'd be happy to help you out. But because there are many different ways, and because I already have Ruby installed on my Mac, um, I can't really show you how to redo it, because it, it's installing it from source is a bit tricky. But it shouldn't be too hard if you want to go that route. Don't. Definitely look at those instructions, at least before... Uh, deciding to choose an easier way. All right, so now we're ready to start looking at some Ruby itself. And we're gonna do this by meeting IRB. IRB is one of the um, best ways to get started in Ruby. IRB stands for the Interactive Ruby Shell. Obviously, shell doesn't start with B, but the B comes from Ruby. So let's get into that right now. All right, so we're gonna start by opening up a terminal here. Let me just make this a bit bigger. And we're gonna type IRB. Enter, and that puts us into the IRB console, the interactive Ruby shell. Now, the interactive Ruby shell is great when you're learning Ruby because it's basically a place where you can like, write one line of Ruby at a time and see what gets returned from that one line, and so you can really play with the language and learn how all the little pieces work together. It's a great way to um, get started, and you'll find we're going to use it a lot in the next week or so, or in the next screencast or so. So let's start by just doing some simple calculator-like stuff. We can do 1 plus 2 and hit enter. And you see we have a little arrow here and 3. And this little arrow means that whatever comes after it is the, uh, is the value that is returned, um, that is the, the value that is the result of the um, executing of this line of code, this statement we've made here. So we can do something else. For example, if we say print um, hello world. And you can see there we've got hello world, and then we have the arrow, and nil. Hello world is getting printed out from this function we've just called print. But nil is the result that is returned from that function call. The print function doesn't return anything. So nil is the result of this function call, but hello world is get, getting printed out um, by the print function. Um, now, I use parentheses when calling that print function, but that is not necessary. Obviously, um, that's what you do in something like JavaScript or PHP. In Ruby, that's not necessarily. So let's use a different function. This time we'll call put s, which puts a string on the console. And if we do hello world this time, you can see we get hello world and nil because put s or puts, which stand for put string, just like print, doesn't have a return value. It just prints something to the console and then returns nil, which is Ruby's nothing value, kind of like null in JavaScript. Um, so these are two great functions that you'll uh, learn that you'll use a lot when um, you when you start writing scripts of Ruby. Then you're, you're going to then run in the console. These are um, puts is probably the main way you're going to put stuff onto the console. Um, the main difference between them, as you can see here, is that puts put puts or put s puts a line break after the text that it puts to the screen. Okay, now let's write a function of our own. So instead of using the function keyword as you would in JavaScript, use the def keyword, which stands for define. So let's define a function called greet. Now 
um, when you're writing a function in Ruby, you might be tempted to use square brackets, <coughs> sorry, curly brackets, but in Ruby, you don't use curly brackets to define a function. We're just going to hit enter. Then I'm just going to do a space to show the content of it. And let's do this. Let's say return. Hi there. And then to close the function, we just use end. Now, <coughs> notice how we wrote three lines here and did not um, get any response until we'd written that third line. And then um, the console returned nil. That's because Ruby realized, or the IRB realized, that when we wrote def, um, we were going to write a function. And so it we need more than just one line of code to make this expression complete. So it waited until it had all the lines of code necessary to have a complete expression. As you can see, we have def, we have the function body, and then we have end, which ends the function. And then it says, okay, this function has no return. Now, obviously, as you can see, it does have a return value. Um, nil here is not the execution of the function um, that's returning as nil, it's the writing of the function that's returning as nil. For So, for example, um, let's use this function now. So we're just going to say, if we just say greet, simple way to call the function, you can see the return value from the function is high there, because that's what we told the function to return. Now, that's handy, using the return word like that, and that's what you're used to in JavaScript or PHP. But, in Ruby, that's not ne necessary. So we could just write def, and we'll say uh, greet2 here, just so we know it's a different function. Um, and we'll just say uh, hi there. And we'll just say how are you, just to make it a different function. Do something different. Whoops, got to end the code. And so there we go. Now, um, I accidentally hit enter, so I had to close the line quote on this line, but that's okay. So now, um, if we call greet2, Hi there, how are you? You can see it's printed out right like that. And we never specified return because by default, Ruby returns the last expression in a function. Or the last statement, um, the last line of code within a function is returned. Now, you sometimes you'll want to use the return statement if you want, want to return earlier in the function than the end if you're doing something a little more complex. But a lot of the time, you'll find that you won't need to include the return keyword and you can just put the um, return value for that function as the very last statement, and Ruby returns that. Okay, so um, let's see, is there anything else we should look at as an introduction to IRB here? I think that'll be all for this screencast. This should get you um, warmed into Ruby, get thinking about whether you want to learn Ruby. Um, I think it's a really worthwhile investment. So, um... So that's what we're going to look at for today. Um, thanks for watching along with this Ruby for Newbie series. Um, feel free to ask any questions uh, you may have. Just put them in the comments. And um, I know this was kind of a light tutorial, but it was an introduction. We're going to get into some deeper stuff next week. Hopefully we'll start looking at some of the Ruby syntax. And um, we looked at a bit today, looking at how you write functions and call them. Um, but that was very brief. We're going to cover that in a bit more depth next week, and we'll also look at writing some more Ruby. So thanks for watching, and um, see you around.